This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. Today, I'm ready to receive the incorruptible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. I will never be the same again. Come on. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. Best shout ever. Good morning. I was thinking uh, during the first service, I was on the front row, and I was remembering back to July, the last Sunday in July in 1990. It was the first time uh, Jean and I ever held a service in this building. Uh, there were red pews everywhere, red curtains over the baptistry. Uh, a handful of people were here for that first service, about a hundred. And we began a work of God here. And I, I was thinking while I was sitting here on the front row, I was the Wednesday night teacher back in 1990. And there would be some Wednesday nights, there were only two people in the room. Uh, Gene Evans, my husband, was one of them. And there was a man named James Austin, and he was on the other end of the front pew. And I preached to a lot of empty pews. But I'm telling you, those two men, I just preached them happy every Wednesday night. And uh, I, I, that's what I'm going to do this morning. But I want you to know I'm real glad there's more than just two people in the room today. So why don't you pat yourself on the back and say, I made it this morning. And God is going to talk to me. So let's release that. Holy Spirit. Uh, it, it's said of you in, in the book of Revelation that we who are in the church need to hear what you're saying. So Holy Spirit, right now, I ask you to say something. I thank you that you live in me. You're going to rise up out of me. You're going to come through my mouth, and words are going to be spoken that are not of me, not of my personality, not of what I've already intended to do, but words that are given to me by you, Holy Spirit. So even as we have prayed, come Holy Spirit, come and have your way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. The test of anything is, does it work? Don't you hate to buy something that's supposed to work and it, it just doesn't work? Now, there's a lot of advertising in the world today and all of the advertising tells us that the products being sold work. But I'm here to tell you that is not always true. Uh, I, I am a woman who finds herself in her latter years. It's very evident to you that I've never done facial surgery. Have you figured that out yet? You know, I've, I've never lifted anything that's falling down. And uh, in spite of how good I look today, uh, what's underneath all of this is not high and lifted up. It really is uh, falling down. And while I've not had facial surgery, I have bought every product that has ever been made that says anti-aging, wrinkle remover. Uh, men, you may not be familiar with this. Every woman in the room at some point will encounter these products. And I've used every one of them. And they do not work. <laughs> Gravity is stronger than what's in a, a jar. Uh, Estee Lauder cannot solve the problem of gravity. And so while it's good to go to the counters and have them lie to you, it doesn't work. Just take it from me. Uh, even as I stand here, I am aging with anti-aging cream on my face. I am aging <laughs> as I stand here. Does it work? Do, does it work? Years ago, there was a, a commercial on television. Uh, it, it was a commercial uh, selling knives, kitchen cutting knives that were made in Japan. And the knives had a Japanese name. And in the commercial, this Japanese man illustrated how marvelous these knives were. And I'm telling you what the guy could do with those kitchen knives was incredible. I mean, he could chop onions, celery, meat. He even sliced through a tin can. 
And uh, I, I was just highly impressed. And my mother bought those knives for me as a Christmas gift. And I took them into the kitchen to do the miracles that the man had done on television. <laughs> and they didn't work. And Gene said to me, when I said to him, these knives do not work, he said, June, I could have told you, you don't need knives, you need that Japanese man in the kitchen. <laughs> I said, perhaps, perhaps you're right. There was a sign over a repair shop door, a repair shop, and the sign said, we fix anything and everything. To enter, knock loudly, our doorbell doesn't work. So I think this is the way life is. There, there's a lot of uh, things out there that are advertised to us as working. And yet sometimes the doorbell's broken. It doesn't work. There's something in every one of us that, that knows life is supposed to work. Whatever that means to you, it just means that your life is supposed to go well. Uh, you know, your relationships are supposed to be healthy. Life is supposed to work. That, that's written in the DNA of every person ever born. Life should work. So all of us are, are caught in this relentless search for the big fix. And the big fix is what makes it work. And, and the world is selling us everything they can. This automobile this house, this car, this, this surgery, this medicine. Uh, just buy your magazines, turn on your TVs, go to your websites, and there's all kind of things out there that are saying we can fix anything and everything. But yet when we ring the doorbell, it doesn't work. It, it just doesn't work. In the ministry of Jesus, we are told that the time came when Jesus felt he must needs go through Samaria. He, he was in southern Palestine. He wanted to go to Galilee, which was in the north. And uh, normally, uh, a Jewish man would detour around Samaria because the Samaritans and the Jews did not like each other. There was deep racial prejudice between these two groups of people. And Jews would have nothing to do with Samari Samaritans, and Samaritans would have nothing to do with Jews, dating back hundreds of years in the history uh, of these people. Uh, they even worshipped in two different places. And the Bible says one day Jesus felt he had to go through Samaria. And we are told about that journey that Jesus and the disciples came to this well in Samaria. Now, in that culture, there is no running water. So villages, cities, were built around water supplies. And the well was a gathering place. It was the Starbucks of that generation. <laughs> it, it was where the girls would go early in the morning and they would draw the water that they needed for their homes. And they would hang out at the wells. The animals would be watered. Wells were just a real crucial part of a village and a very important place of, of just, you know, relationship. And the Bible says that Jesus was sitting by this Samaritan well. And he was by himself because his disciples had gone to find food for him. It was at the noonday hour. And while he's sitting at, at this well, this Samaritan woman comes to draw water. Now, as her story unfolds, we understand why she's there at noonday. Because in her culture, she is considered not a very nice woman. Uh, we find from the telling of her story, uh, she's had five husbands, and she's on man number six, who is a live-in. I guess she hooked up with him at the well. I don't, they didn't have internet back then. They probably hooked up at the wells back then. And she's living with, with this guy. 
and she's at the well at the noonday because she doesn't want to come down there early in the morning and be shunned by all of the women who probably would have nothing to do with her. So she comes in the heat of the day when nobody would draw water in, in the heat of the day. And, and Jesus strikes up a conversation with her. Now, this is an odd pair, uh, a Jewish man and a Samaritan woman who's been around the block a couple of times. Uh, a Samaritan woman who's not, not highly, highly esteemed. And we know from this story that men are her big fix. Uh, this woman's looking for something, and she's looking for it with men. Uh, she's on man number six. Was she abused? Possibly. Uh, had, had she had trouble with men? Absolutely. Did she have children with these men? Most likely. I mean, this, this woman's big fix is men, and when she's through with number six, she'll find number seven because uh, she's looking for a life that will work. And, and Jesus begins to talk to her. Now, the, the funny thing about the story is Jesus never talks to her about men. He never mentions men. But he begins to talk to her about being thirsty. And he began to talk to her about water. And in John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, this is what Jesus said to her. Whoever drinks of this water, meaning the water at the well, is going to thirst again. But whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, now listen to this, shall never thirst again. What he's saying there in Bible terms, there's a big fix. There's a big fix. Uh, will never thirst again, but the water I give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And, and he, he says to this woman, uh, your problem's not men. Your problem is you're thirsty. You're a thirsty woman. Her need was thirst, and the big fix for thirst is water. And so he talks to her about being thirsty and water and said to her, if you'll drink of this water I'm talking about, you'll never thirst again. Now, how many know that kind of gets your attention when you have to go to the well every day and draw water? We may not understand that. We don't draw water. Suppose I said to you, I know where you can buy underwear and you'll never have to wash underwear again. (laughs) All of you who've got underwear piled in the laundry room floor, go buy some. Because you think, my goodness, I never have to wash his underwear again. I'm going to go buy him, you know, a lifetime supply of underwear. Need, thirst, big fix, water. And he said, uh... Look, your problem's not out here with men. He says something is going to have to spring up on the inside of you. Uh, uh, you, You've got an inward thing, an inward thirst. And and something is going to come inside of you that's going to be the big fix for for your, your life. Then we are told... And a a later time, Jesus went to the city of Jerusalem to be there for the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, to the Jewish people, the Feast of Tabernacles is Christmas, Easter, Fourth of July, a birthday party, all rolled into one fabulous celebration. And every Jewish man was required to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. And, and the Jewish people would go to Jerusalem. Uh, the celebration under the Levitical law lasted seven days. They tacked an eighth day onto it. And the Jewish people would celebrate and eat, have all kind of religious services. They would build these uh, booths, these little huts, to remind them of the time when they were homeless in the wilderness, uh, they, they had all of these offerings of water 
to remind them of the time in the wilderness when Moses struck a rock and God provided them water. And this Feast of Tabernacles was so involved with water that it was actually known as an outpouring of a, a, a festival, a water outpouring. And the high priest would fill a silver vase with water. And then there would be this parade, and they would go to the altar and pour water all over the altar, celebrating in the Feast of Tabernacles. And John chapter 7 says, on the last day, the eighth day of that feast, that Jesus stood up in the midst of it, And we're told in verse 37 and 38, he cried out this, Is anybody thirsty? And he was standing in water as he said it. He he was part of this great outpouring of water. And he stood up and he's going to deal with thirst again. And he said, Is anybody out there thirsty? Talking to people who are doing all this religious activity to worship Jehovah God and he said if anybody is thirsty let him come unto me and drink for as the scripture says out of your innermost being shall flow a river shall flow a river of living water so now this well that springs up becomes a river uh, of living water And, and Jesus was saying to, to these Jewish people. Uh, look, just, just going through rituals of religion is not going to fix your life. Uh, just, just bringing all of this, this stuff to an altar is not going to fix your life. There has to be uh, something that, that happens inside of you because, again, he identifies it. Your need is thirst and, and your big fix is water that comes to the inside of you. Now, this issue of thirst, I'm, I'm not sure we can appreciate it. Uh, most of us know thirst as dehydration. Uh, and dehydration is pretty bad. But thirst is terrible. Uh, we can live 40 days without food. We can just live a few short days without water. And they say one of the most terrible ways to die is thirst. And in Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2, the psalmist wrote, As the deer pants after the water brooks, so my soul thirsts after thee, O God. My, th- my soul thirsts for you. Now, the Bible has said right, right here, that on the inside of every one of us is a soul that is thirsty. We sometimes just read that and think, well, this is written to religious people who really love God with all their heart. But no, the Bible's identifying a need here. Uh, there's There's an inward thirst. There's something that happened to humans way back there in the Garden of Eden when Adam sinned. And, and the lives of people became arid, barren wastelands. And God said to Adam, no more will it be a fruitful field, Adam. You're going to have to sweat. You're going to find thorns and thistles. And all of a sudden, the whole landscape had changed because of sin. And God put his finger on it. He said, you're thirsty. Uh, on the inside of you is a barren wasteland. And there is a soul, an inward part of every human being that is crying out to God. And the world is selling us a doorbell that doesn't work. Selling us a doorbell that cannot bring inward water. Uh, Promising us all that they can promise us. If you'll do this, you'll no longer be thirsty. And we buy into it and we're thirsty. And and Jesus came, and he said, look, uh, I I know where there's water. You'll never thirst again. It it will be a well springing up with you. In fact, it'll be so powerful, it'll flow out of you. 
you won't even be able to contain it on the inside of you. Thirst, the need, the answer, water. Now, Jesus on the cross spoke seven last words. And uh, the fifth word that he spoke was the shortest word. And he said, I thirst. And I think most of us just read that and think he wanted water. And I'm sure he did want water. But dear people, it was far, far more prophetic than that. Because Jesus had taken the sins of the whole world upon himself. And the last word he spoke about himself is, I thirst. There was an aridness, a barrenness that had come to his life. And he cried out as the psalmist did, I thirst. I thirst. I, I thirst. And the Bible says there was a prophetic word that was fulfilled that day. Psalm 69, verse 31. In my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And uh, this, is, this is what life does. We're thirsty. And we buy into all sorts of things. And all it is it is vinegar. God wrote in the book of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 2, verse 13, he said, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountains of living water, and have hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns which can hold no water. These are talking about religious people. And we need to understand, we can, we can build a very good structure here. We can do something that the world will put in their magazines. And they'll come and listen to our music and admire our buildings. But unless God is in the middle of it, it is a broken cistern. It is a broken cistern. Because there is a thirst. There is a thirst. And this is a thirsty generation. This is a dehydrated culture. Severely dehydrated. And I think it's just a symbol that we all walk around with little bottles of water, guzzling water, because it, we're thirsty. We're, we're thirsty. But then in John chapter 7, Jesus was speaking about these rivers of living water that are going to come out of thirsty people. And Jesus identifies the water. And it says that he spoke about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The big fix for life is the Holy Spirit. There, there's, there's something that is going to happen that, that is going to concern the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I was in Mexico. I, I was speaking, and uh, I, I didn't understand the Spanish language. And the Mexican congregation I was in was a large congregation. And there were probably several thousands of people there. And, uh, you know, they had a schedule, but they didn't go by the schedule. Uh, they didn't start when they said they would. You didn't speak at the time they said you would. And I just kind of there trying to pick through a language I didn't understand. And from my seat to the bathroom was a long journey. I mean, I had to go up an aisle, down another aisle, out a door, across a courtyard, into a building, up two flights of stairs to get to the ladies' room. So I quit drinking water. <laughs> Because I didn't know when I was going to stand up. And I thought, well, if I drink a lot of water, it'll be a short message and a short prayer line. Uh, so I just quit drinking water. Got very sick. And when it was time for me to speak, I, th I, I really prayed. I said, God, I don't know that I'm standing to my feet. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I had a headache. I was dizzy. I, I was uh, sweaty. My hands were, were shaking. I felt weak. I, I felt fatigued. And someone came to me later, and, and they said, uh, you're dehydrated. You need to start drinking water. And I, I know something about what that's like. I know something about how thirst 
uh, just really can upend your, your life. And let us be very sure that when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he was not just talking about his death and the period that he was going to put to sin, but he was looking forward to a day that the Bible calls the day of Pentecost, when there was going to be this release of the Holy Spirit and men would never thirst again. The big fix would be in the world. And the big fix would be not only in the world, but would be in people. The, the, the big fix. And we would thirst no more. Acts chapter 1 verse 5, Jesus said this, For John truly baptized you with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Now listen to that. He's taken this, this picture of water, and now he's put it with the Holy Spirit, and he said there's coming a baptism. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he was saying this to disciples who had already been born again. Uh, these disciples had seen the resurrected Jesus had met with him in an upper room. He had breathed into them, John 20 tells us, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit in those disciples was like it was in John 4, a well of water springing up. That Holy Spirit was springing up. But Jesus was going to release the Holy Spirit into the lives of people in the way the Holy Spirit had never been released before. There was going to be a baptism. There was going to be this immersion, this total inside, full of Holy Spirit, outside, swished in the power and the water of the Holy Spirit. Until you come out of it, you're dripping wet with the water of the Holy Spirit. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, it, it goes on to say in Acts 2.37, it will come to pass in the last days. I will pour out my spirit, an outpouring. Uh, how, how would we say it in the South? A gully washer. Do you know what a gully washer is? Just an absolute gully washer. In the flood of Noah, we are told that the windows of heaven opened up and water came from heaven and the fountains of the deep opened up and water came from the deep and the earth was flooded and Jesus said there's coming a flood of the Holy Spirit. Heaven is going to open and something inside of you is going to open and you shall be baptized, totally immersed totally inundated in the power uh, of the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus spoke this to his disciples, he was about to leave the earth, and he was going to go to heaven to take up the next part of his ministry, which is to sit at the right hand of the Father and pray for us until he comes to earth the second time, which is what he's doing today. So Jesus is about to leave, and this whole program of kingdom and church is going to pass into the hands of people. Nobody's ever seen a church. Nobody has any idea what a church looks like. The only role model any of these people in the upper room had was the Jewish religion, and, and God was through with that. This was the age of grace. Jesus said, I'm going to build a church, and he's going to use these people in the upper room to do it, and there is no plan B. He's going to use people. And I get real nervous about that. Do you get nervous about that? Because I'm telling you, people mess up God's plan. I just... I just uh, you know, enjoyed marriage until I got married. And Gene just messed it up. For me, marriage was what you watched on television with violin music. And then I married Gene, and he wouldn't do what I wanted him to do. Just messed it up. 
Then we had two kids. That messed it up even further, you know. Uh, just, just the reality of life. So we read the Bible. Adam blew it. Noah blew it. Abraham blew it. Uh, King David blew it. Simon Peter blew it. Judas Iscariot blew it. Because that's what people do really, really good. They blow it. I was in the car with my little grandson. At that time, he was four years old. I was going to clean my glasses. He said, Grandma, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to clean my glasses. He said, let me do it. I said, okay. I had my little cloth, and I handed him my glasses and my, my cloth, and I was digging in my handbag for the little cleaner, you know, the little bottle they give you to clean your glasses. And I said, Sam, I'm looking for the cleaner. He said, don't worry about it, Grandma. I just spit on your glasses, and I'm cleaning them. <laughs> and sure enough, my glasses were covered with Sam's spit, and he was cleaning my glasses. How many have known some people who spit on your glasses? <laughs> Has it ever dawned on you hurricanes are not named for dogs? They're named for people. <laughs> Katrina, Andrew, Camille. They don't name them Spot, Rover. <laughs> named for, for people. So how could Jesus, how could Jesus pass it to people? And it was not that Jesus had so much faith in people, but he has great, tremendous faith in what the Holy Spirit can do with people. The Holy Spirit. He knew the Holy Spirit was the big fix for people. Hallelujah. And he said, we're releasing the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to go to heaven. And boys, you don't have to worry about it. The comforter is coming. And the Holy Spirit is going to be released. Which is exactly what happened uh, on the day uh, of Pentecost. Now, listen to what it says. Acts 1.8. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The, the need is thirst, the Holy Spirit is the water, and the doorbell is power. And, and that word power in the Greek is dunamis. We get the word dynamic. And what power is, it's a heaven dynamic that is added to your life when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit and it enables you and the Holy Spirit to do life together and to make life work. That's what power is. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit, not that he comes in you, he comes upon you. And to be baptized with the Holy Spirit Number one, you have to be born again so that the Holy Spirit's in you. But dear people, the Holy Spirit did not come just to live in you. He came to flow out of you in power to make your lives work. You shall receive power. You shall receive power. I may not be a big woman today in body size, but I am a powerful woman of God because of the Holy Spirit. I have received power because the Holy Spirit was not just a well springing up in me when I read my Bible. The Holy Spirit on March the 25th, 1969, rose up like a river out of me and the Holy Spirit changed my life didn't change my life change me you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be God's not going to change what you do he's going to change who you be and then what you do will be all right what you do will be all right thirst and the Holy Spirit I just, I just, I've never done heroin. Uh, I, I've never, you know, been a woman that went out, got drunk on the weekends. I've never looked at pornography. But I, I know enough about it to tell any of you this. 
compared to the Holy Spirit. That's boring, dead stuff. Boring, dead stuff. So Acts 2, 4 says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The, the analogy of water in the Bible is always words. Ephesians 5 says husbands are to wash their wives with their words. So the Holy Spirit is... How is he going to flow out of us? Not going to come out our fingernails. He's not going to come out our eyeballs, our ears. Out of the abundance of what's in us, we speak. If you're angry, your words will be angry. If you're depressed, your words will be depressed. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, words given to you by the Holy Spirit will come out of you. Now, the enemies made this controversial. Uh, the devil does not want us to go here. I was raised in a religious system for the first 30 years of my life, and we didn't speak with tongues. Uh, people, people used to say to me, well, speaking in tongues is of the devil. And I used to think about that, and I think, well, if it's of the devil, why don't they do it in strip joints? Why aren't the drug dealers on the corner speaking in tongues if it's of the devil? Why do we only do it in church? Uh, you know, let's just think honestly about this. Now, why would God do this? We, people, I want you to understand, we are a privileged generation to live in a time when the Holy Spirit's been poured out, and we have this incredible ability to speak with other tongues as he gives us utterance. And the enemy just comes and wants us to put this in the closet. Uh, the enemy wants us to not teach you about this. The enemy wants us to just act like this is something you can do if you want to. I'm telling you, it is life-changing. It is a life-changing thing. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I looked it up on uh, the website. Do you know what happens for you to begin to speak a language, any language. I can't give you the scientific words, but there's a part of your brain, if you want to say a sentence, a part of your brain begins to work. It sends a message to your speech center in your brain. Your speech center in your brain sends out messages to certain nerves. And these nerves will travel, first of all, to your mouth, your lips, then they travel to your tongue to make it move. And then the nerves come all the way down here to your stomach and diaphragm because your stomach and diaphragm have to push up air so that the mouth has air to speak. And, and then these vocal cords have got to vibrate. All of that has to happen for you to say dog. Dog. And when you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now what happened there is they began to speak that language that came from the Spirit. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's up here in the brain working, sending out His words sending out his nerves, sending out his power to every part of our body so that what we say out of our mouth is totally supernatural. The Holy Spirit charging through the human body, uh, getting up into your head. How many need the Holy Spirit to get up in your head? How many need the Holy Spirit to take your dry, dry mouths and to fill them with the water uh, of what he gives to you? So uh, it was 1969, 47 years ago. I had become a Christian when I was 15 years old. As a 30-year-old woman, I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I had no idea what this was going to do to my life. God, God literally has changed the, the woman 
that, that I am. I, 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 at age 30, could have no idea uh, of the life that I lived. I just spoke in tongues because I read it in the Bible and felt I was supposed to do it. But this Holy Spirit and I took up a relationship together. Uh, and, and I decided that the Holy Spirit is a person, and I understood he was going to talk to me, he was going to talk through me, and that my ultimate goal in life was not to be a famous speaker. It, it was not to be somebody who writes a lot of books. I wanted to be a spirit-filled woman. And people who knew me, I wanted them to say, she's full of God. She's full of God. I met people who were full of God. Uh, we went to Catherine Kuhlman's meeting. Catherine Kuhlman was a woman who could heal people by the power of the Holy Spirit. 10,000 people in a room. And she comes out and starts preaching. I'm sitting in the nosebleed section with Jean. And I thought, this is the craziest woman I've ever heard. I didn't like her preaching. I didn't like her. She just was, didn't ring my bell. Have you ever met people? I hope I'm ringing your bell. But, you know, sometimes there are people who don't ring your bell. And all of a sudden, in the middle of a sermon, she stops and points to where we're sitting. She says, there's somebody right there, and you're being healed of varicose veins. We're up here in the nosebleed section, and she's pointing to me and Jean. We don't have varicose veins, so we're in these tiered seats. We turn to look behind us, and the woman's legs are at our eye level, and we see varicose veins disappear. We watched them disappear. And I thought, what kind of woman is this that stands on a stage and the Holy Spirit says to her, there are varicose veins in the third balcony. I'll tell you, that woman caught my attention. I thought, I, this is the kind of woman I want. I wasn't interested in the varicose veins. I was interested in hearing there's somebody in the third balcony and pointing a finger. I wanted to be that kind of woman. I wanted to be that kind of woman. Now, the Holy Spirit is not a quick fix. The Holy Spirit is an eternal fix. And the only way this ever happens is relationship. You can't run in and out of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, Don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's the will of God for everybody in the room. You, you want to know the will of God? Here it is. Be filled with with the Spirit. They were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. And I found that speaking with other tongues was a connection with God. That speaking with other tongues was like spiritual exercise. It says I could build myself up by praying in the Holy Spirit. Uh, that speaking in tongues took me into revelations took me into a dimension I couldn't have gotten to. So that in July 2007, our son Gary uh, basically lay dead. He had been hit uh, by a drunk driver. He uh, had had surgery because of the accident. And uh, he lacked oxygen. We don't know the details. He was without oxygen for a long period of time. They got his heart beating again, but he was brain damaged. And so they come to me in the hospital at 2 o'clock in the morning, and they say, Miss Evans, there's just nothing we can do about your son. He's just, he's just brain damaged. And we're sending him to the hospital. We're going to put him on a feeding tube. And I said, I don't want my son living on a feeding tube. And they said, Miss Evans, you're not going to stand by his bed and watch him starve to death. This is not a pleasant thing. You're going to have to cook him up to a feeding tube. And I'm saying, well, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just standing in the hall, and they're telling me my son has no hope. Now, listen to me, people. When the world rings the doorbell, your mind starts doing this. Your mind disappears into fear. Your emotions rise up. No hope. And, and I knew I had to get a grip on myself. 
And so I went to the hospital chapel and I laid on the floor and I spoke in tongues for over two hours because the Holy Spirit will pray for you when you're not able to pray. You can exit your emotions and mind and plug in to the Holy Spirit. And when the world rings your doorbell and it's disaster, you need a Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. I thank God my son's alive and well today. No brain damage because the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit works. Did you know the last invitation in the Bible is about water? Revelation 22, verse 17. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him drink of the water of life freely. God, God's not going to make you get born again. God's not going to make you uh, come and drink of the water of the Holy Spirit and be baptized. God's not going to make you speak in tongues. It's an invitation. If you're tired of a life that doesn't work and your doorbell's broken, I am here to tell you, I have been baptized with the Holy Spirit for 47 years. I'm 77 years old, and the Holy Spirit's done a good job with this old girl and this old man. It's not that I haven't had troubles. I haven't had tribulations. I haven't had to use faith. The Holy Spirit doesn't just do it all for you, but I'm here to tell you when I rang that bell and called power, my doorbell work. You shall receive power. And he went through my life like water, changed my bad temper, helped me crucify my flesh, taught me how to stand behind a podium and teach you, put me on a prophetic purpose path, all due to the Holy Spirit and being immersed in the Holy Spirit. One last story. I've told it here before, but it's my favorite story. I, I had a, a mentor. Her name was Sister Agnes Hood. And Sister Hood, I was 30 years old when I met her. She was uh, 50 years older than me, 80 years old. And uh, she had been baptized with the Holy Spirit 50 years. And I had just gotten baptized with the Holy Spirit. I didn't know anything about anything. I, I, I didn't know anything I've taught you today. And Sister Hood and I would pray together. We would talk together. She was my mentor. And the time came when she would die. I did not know this. Uh, she was in the hospital. She was about three days from death. Uh, they had had to amputate a leg and... Uh, this was back in the 70s, and, you know, hospitals were different then. So uh, she really wasn't in an intensive care. They just had her on a bed in a room waiting for her to die. They had her hooked up to all kinds of little tubes and medicines, and it was my turn to stay with her all night. Uh, we took turns, church people. So I was sitting by her bed. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I'd been reading by a nightlight. This old woman hadn't moved in hours. As I said, at the time, I didn't know it, but she's about three days away from dying. She's in her 80s and, uh, you know, not doing well. The nurse comes in, and she indicates to me she's going to roll her over on her side and give her some kind of shot or medicine. And so I, I stood up on one side of the bed, and the nurse was on the other, and she rolled miss hood toward me and you know the woman's out of it i mean she's medicated sedated near death and i was just going to hold her shoulders and when this nurse put that needle into her hip i guess it woke her up because that old woman sat straight up in bed and listen to me she started speaking in tongues at the top of her lungs she had a voice louder than mine two o'clock in the morning in a hospital and this old 80 something year old woman with tubes in her arms sitting up in bed with her arms like this speaking in tongues at the top of her lungs or just echoing 
down the hall, and the nurse jumped backwards. And I thought, I'm not touching this with a 10-foot pole. And I'm just, you know, looking at the nurse like I don't know what's going on, patting sisterhood. The nurse is looking at the chart. Sisterhood is, kid, run, Dave. I ain't just booming. The nurse runs and gets the second nurse. Now two of them are looking at the chart. And I'm just petting sisterhood. And she just booming, kid, run, Dave. And now they're talking. And they said, well, we guess we're going to have to call her doctor. And I thought, oh, God, they're going to get him out of bed. And she's just speaking in tongues. And so I said to them, I said, uh, excuse me. I said, look, I'm I'm a real good friend of hers. And I said, she often has fits like this. <laughs> and they said, she does? I said, yeah, she often has fits like this. And I said, if you'll just leave the room, I think I can get her back to sleep. And they said, you think you can? I said, yeah, don't call the doctor. I said, I think I can get her to lay back down. Well, I did. They left. I got her to lay back down. But dear people, it was a life-changing moment for this woman. Because here's this 80-something-year-old woman, been baptized in the Holy Spirit over 50 years, has moved with the Holy Spirit, She was a missionary sent by the Holy Spirit to South America, taught me how to pray in the Holy Spirit, and they came in the middle of the night. She's nearly dead, and they stuck her with a needle, and the Holy Spirit came out. And I said, God, I want to be a woman that when life and people stick me with the Holy, with with things, anger doesn't come out. The Holy Spirit does. Kiranda Bokosoto. Filled, filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. Sisterhood changed my life. Well, God spoke to me about this house. And Mark, uh, I was praying about it. And, you know, you're always saying to me and Dad that you're reaping our harvest. And this is the harvest time that we're coming up. In in the biblical terms, September and October, harvest months in the Bible. And God said to tell you that for the harvest to come, there has to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit coming to this house, to these leaders, to these elders, to these who work and serve in the kingdom, there's going to be an outpouring of the Spirit on those of us that occupy these seats. There's going to be a change in worship, ministry, prayer time. There's going to be a change in the way we greet and work. There is coming a flood of the Holy Spirit. A flood of the Holy Spirit to reap the harvest. The Bible says in the last days, And we are living in the last days. I will pour my spirit out upon your sons and your daughters. And I'm a spiritual mother over this house. And you're my sons and you're my daughters. And these are the last days. And God is telling you he will come to your life and give you water and fix your life when you form a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet if you would. Now, if you're here and you're not baptized with the Spirit and you do not speak with tongues, but you want to, I want you to come down here first. And we're not going to embarrass you. Just move. Whoever wants to drink has to drink. We can't come and drag you. But I know there are people here. God said to me there are going to be people here who need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Just come right on down. Don't be afraid. Come on down. Release your prayer language. Here she comes. Go make her a powerful woman. Hallelujah. Powerful woman. More than this one. Who else is coming? More than this one. Somebody's caught in something. You need to come and receive the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to all have a prayer here. Not going to do it individually. Anybody else? Anybody else? I still feel there at least uh, maybe five more. You want to come? All right, let's do it this way then. Second invitation. Here comes another one. Come on down, honey. Amen. 
Amen. Just line up in front of me. Just face me. I felt very, you know, I hugged you during the hugging time, and I, I felt you were supposed to be up here. I'm glad you're up here. And God's going to change your life. You're going you're gonna to come to your old years like me, and you're going to say, my goodness. I, I, back there, where I thought I was going to go and where God's taken me, going to change your life. God said today the map of your life is going to change, and you're going to start going in an upward way you could never have found without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit. Rewriting your story today, my dear. Rewriting your story. I don't know what life's done to you, but God's going to rewrite your story in Jesus' name. Now, if you're in a bad place and your life's not working in a certain area, I want you to come up here, and we're going to pray for outpouring of the Holy Spirit on that place. Just come on up. You're facing a problem. You're having difficulty. could be relationships. It can be money. It can be jobs. You need something fixed in your life. I'm going to ask Mark, Robin, Jean, the elders to come up. Just line up right here. If you still want to come up and be baptized with the Spirit, come on up. Now, what we're going to do right here is I'm going to lead everybody in a prayer. And all of you who came up and said you needed life fixed, I want you to just come on up here. I want you to come up and pray this prayer. And we're going to release the Holy Spirit. And uh, if you do not pray in tongues, I pray that you will pray in tongues. You will never regret it. I, I felt like God was going to touch you today, my dear son. God's going to touch you. I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, it's like a Rubik's Cube you're trying to put together. God's going to put the cube together for you. All the sides are going to match in Jesus' name. So I, I can't do your speaking in tongues for you. I have no agenda to make anybody speak with tongues. I'm just telling you what it did for me. But I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And we're going to ask God to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then you will cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.4 says they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And you know how you begin to speak? Like any little baby. You make a sound in your throat. You move your lips. You move your tongue. And you just say that sound. And you don't, you don't make up a sound. You just make a sound. Ah. And the Holy Spirit will begin to give you utterance. A baby learning to speak doesn't say mother, daddy. Makes a sound. Mama, uh, dad, dad. And that baby begins to speak. And by the time he's 20, he'll be saying mom and dad. He began to speak. And the beginning to speak is where we're going to release the Holy Spirit. And hopefully you'll speak with tongues. If not, I just want you to begin to praise God with your whole heart and release the Holy Spirit. This is a release of the Holy Spirit. A river is going to flow out of you. A river is, is going to emerge. And sometimes that baby says things, learning to speak, that sounds silly to us. Nanu, nanu, nanu. We think, that is ridiculous. And the mother says he wants a cookie. That's what that meant. Mother understands the language. Daddy God understands the language. Your head doesn't understand, but Daddy God does. So let's all of us in the congregation pray this prayer with these down here. Father, I thank you today. Jesus is my Lord. I believe in my heart. He was raised from the dead. And he is my Lord. I break all contact with the devil. I forgive people who've wronged me. I am a child of God. But I need power. I need my life to work. And I ask now for a baptism of the Holy Spirit upon my tongue, upon my life, upon my circumstances, out of my belly. The Holy Spirit will flow, and I will be filled with the Spirit. I receive it now. It's mine now. 
Now let's open our mouths, all of us. Begin to speak with tongues. You prayer people, come in front of them and release the Holy Spirit. Yerronga beke sata. Yerosoto rongo. That's right. Now make a sound. Yeah, sure, make a sound. That's right. Say it out loud. That's right. That's right. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. That's it. Yes, that's it. That's it, Robin. That's it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. Over those that didn't come to the altar, I release the Holy Spirit over your lives. That the Holy Spirit and His power will become your doorbell, will become your entrance into life. Father, I thank you for answers, for power, for manifestation, for manifestation. I see plowed ground with seed in them. God's going to rain on what you've already done, what you've already sowed. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. Let me pray with her. In Jesus' name. 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 In Jesus name. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. The Lord said to tell you that the valley of tears is going to become a place of rejoicing. That where the enemy took you through valleys of tears, they're going to become places of rejoicing. Uh, the enemy came, and the enemy rode in the sand of your life. But God said to tell you, it wasn't written in concrete, it was written in sand. And the wind of the Holy Spirit is blowing over the sand of the devil's writing. And the Holy Spirit's going to come and write in concrete a word and a purpose and a calling over your life that shall never be eradicated. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. Now I'm going to ask Mark to come. He's going to dismiss. Uh, if you're here at the altar and you still need prayer, we'll stay and pray with you. If you need prayer for other things, the prayer team's here. Uh, God bless you. Just put your arms around yourself. That's my hug for me to you. God bless you for being a part of what God did today. Amen. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. Hallelujah. Go let the Holy Spirit ding your doorbell. I bless you as you go. I bless you with angels. Father, I ask you just to keep us safe as we go. Let us be the light of the world. Let the power of the Holy Spirit work through our lives. And we do. We thank you, God, that this house will be open to your move and to your presence and to your power. We invite you, Holy Spirit, have your way on this corner with us in Jesus' name. Amen. I bless you. Be blessed as you go. Have a great week.